All right, so we've cherry picked the best cases in our office, right? We, we said this is the best cases. We've diagnosed the patient, and now it's time to what? Numb the patient up. Remember, the bar is set really low. Patients are scared of what? The procedure, and they're scared of getting numb, and that they want to make sure that they're numb enough to go through the procedure without having, uh, oh, my friend went through it. They said it was painful. The whole procedure was painful, okay? So that's what we don't want to have happen. Anybody ever use this in their office? The wand, you guys have this in your office? Anybody have this, anybody use it ever? Yeah, it's, it's a pretty neat instrument, okay? The only thing is, it's humongous, okay? It's huge, and my office isn't, I can't put something like that on my every countertop, okay? Not only is it interesting, but it's, it's really the concept that's interesting, and the concept is what? Well. A slow IAN injection, that means that if you give it at 60 seconds per carpule, results in a higher success rate than a rapid injection. That's just not, that's the, I always felt, you know, it's a more comfortable injection, but it's actually a more successful injection, and here's the research that agrees with that, okay? But this is what I want you to do. If you really want to get a patient numb, you numb them up, and then you evaluate the pulpal anesthesia before starting treatment. How do I do that? I take endo ice on that same cotton tip applicator and I place it on the tooth and if they don't feel cold, it's time to get started. You must do that on every patient because then you won't have to worry about feeling nervous about going into that hot mandibular tooth. Okay, so evaluate it every patient beforehand. Okay, patients who tell you that they're hard to numb up, guess what? They're hard to numb up. I agree. Okay, use of a buccal infiltration of articane after an IAN may increase success rate. Who likes Articane? Is anybody scared of Articane? Okay, now you're gonna say this research is BS. I agree because it came out of Ohio State University, okay? <laughs> but it's true, okay? I, this is the one thing that I'm gonna believe that Ohio State fans are gonna ever say to me that I'm gonna actually believe is true. Anything that actually, Al Reeder and, and Neustein, their group do a great job with um, anesthetic. And, and so if I'm looking for anesthetic information, these are the people that I, I trust, even though they're from Ohio State, okay? So let's talk about how to get somebody really numb. My goal, never inject in the same place twice. And this is, I'm gonna tell you what I used to do and what I do now. Um, lots of topical, start that off. And then in the maxilla, I don't really have a tough time in the maxilla, most of the time, okay? Uh, two carpials of lidocaine, one to 100,000 epi. And in the mandible, I'd use two carpials of 2% lidocaine with half a carpial of articaine along the buckle. And my success rate was somewhere around 85%. Now, my friends would tell me that, oh, I have a 100% success rate. You know, one, one friend's like, I have like a 103% success rate. You know, like, I was like, wow, I was like, how can you have that high? And so I don't believe anybody, okay? And I'm gonna tell you the truth, that my success rate, I felt, was not high enough. I said, you know, that's not good enough. Um, so this is what I do now, okay? And, you know, I went into the research. I wanted to make sure I was really careful before I started using Articane. So I went and looked at Pogrel's study. Then he was the one that says if you use Articane, you, you might have some paresthesia, but then came back after a few years later and said, well, I rescind that information. So this is what I look at. I do three quarters of a carpal of Articane in a Gal Gates method. Does anybody know what the Gal Gates, how to do a Gal Gates anesthetic? I'm gonna show you, okay? And then I use that last quarter of the carpal along the buckle. This is belts and suspenders, okay? And then I use one carpal of Articane in an IAN injection. My success rate, and I counted, I looked, I did my own little research in my office, and I just see the mandibular hot teeth that I worked on went up to about 95%. Okay, I'm not at 100%. I'm not gonna tell you that I'm at 100%, but I'm at 95%. Okay, and it really did increase quite a bit dramatically. So, Gal Gates. This is how you give a Gal Gates. It's up high, basically. And what you do is you give it in this little notch area, and it kind of drops down. So, let me show you. I got a little video here. The Gal Gates mandibular block provides pulpal anesthesia to the mandibular teeth, the buccal soft tissue and bone, the anterior two-thirds of the tongue and the floor of the oral cavity, the lingual soft tissue and periosteum. 
as well as the skin of the zygoma, the posterior portion of the cheek, and the temporal regions. A 25 gauge long needle is recommended. For the left Galgate's mandibular nerve block, the right-handed operator should sit in a 10 o'clock position facing in the same direction as the patient. For a right Galgate's mandibular nerve block, the right-handed operator should sit in the 8 o'clock position facing the patient. The carotenoid notch is palpated. The barrel of the syringe is placed in the corner of the mouth on the opposite side and the needle tip is placed just below the mesial lingual cusp of the maxillary second molar. That's important right there. And then the needle tip is moved just distal to the second molar. This locates the insertion site for the Galgate's injection. The needle is now inserted until bone is contacted. The average depth of penetration in a Galgate's injection is approximately 25 millimeters. After negative aspiration, 1.8 ml of anesthetic is slowly administered. Following withdrawal of the syringe, the patient is asked to keep their mouth open for two minutes. So that's what most people don't do, is they don't keep their mouth open for two minutes. And that's where the, the critical difference is. Now at that, that point in time, I'm coming out, I'm giving a little bit on the buckle, okay, and then I'm reloading my carpule, okay, and then I'm doing my IAN. Now, there's a specialty, I, which I was, wasn't very familiar with, a dental anesthetic specialty. And that actually, that's a specialty. And, and what they say is that, they tell me that if you take your thumb and put it where they tell you to put it, and then you take your, that middle finger and put it in the patient's ear, and you follow that line, you're gonna hit that gal gates every time. Okay, so that's kind of your trick on how to get the gal gates just done right. And then the IAN. Now I know you know how to do an IAN, so I'm not going to teach you how to do an IAN. You're, you're professionals at that. And that's when I do this. I, I test. You must test at this point in time. If the patient has lip signs and tongue signs, they are, guess what? Numb in the lip and tongue, okay? That doesn't necessarily mean that they're numb in the tooth. And if you have done that, that means you've done the, the anesthetic correctly, okay? And if you're still having pain you put cold, oh yeah, doc, I still feel it. Don't get started, okay? Then it's time for, my tip to you, the intra-injections, okay? And the first in intra-injection that I would do would be an intraligamentary. Is that people familiar with intraligamentary? Love it. You use a ligajet or anything like that? Awesome, they're, they're great. Um, then I'll go to the intraosseous. That's my number two. And then our favorite is the rinsing out with the intrapulpal, okay? So we try to stay away from that if we can. Okay, but it's a necessity sometimes. Intra, uh, intraligamentary, you know, we, we do this type of, anybody seen this before? Use this, this is great. I think it's wonderful. You give it right into that sulcus there. Intraosseous, who's used this before? Okay, um, which one, what do you use? Uh, got both if it's a difficult spot, but the X tip. X tip, okay, X tip. Okay, anybody else use X-tip? Okay, so the first time I used X-tip was, oh, was horrible. I did, it, it didn't work for me. The second time I used it, it tremendously had difficulty with it. And what was the problem? The problem was I was doing it absolutely incorrectly, okay? So I was going in unattached gingiva, things were spinning, you know, smoke was coming out. So, you know, you got to get it in the right spot. So one, you have to be an attached gingiva, and you have to be distal to the tooth that I like to, I like to put a distal to the tooth that we're working on. Okay, and then you put that little cannula in there. But what is the real thing that makes in, you know, an intraosseous work? It's the short little needle that it comes with, right? And you have to get what? You have to get back pressure. And since I have a small skill set of endodontics, I take a rubber stopper off my hand file, put it right there, and that's how I get my back pressure. Now you take that and you put that right there and you put your needle through that, you get great back pressure and this is what I've seen, it, got, it works a lot better that way. So my intraosseous is working really well by using that little rubber stopper. And then our favorite, the intrapulpal, right? You know, you're gonna feel this a little bit, you know, and then, ooh, you know. So what I, I, the, it all comes down to preparing the patient for it, is what it comes down to, is that you, I tell the patient, listen, they go, oh, I, I'm uncomfortable. I go, well, you know, I don't want you to be uncomfortable the whole time, so I'm gonna rinse out the tooth, 
and it's going to feel like a lot of pressure. But after that, you should be much more comfortable because that's what I'm, you know, here to do for you. And at, when they leave, I also remind them. I go, you know, I, I'm really sorry I had to give you that that last injection, but I think that you were felt really comfortable the whole time. And they go leaving thinking that, okay, well, at least I didn't feel like that the whole time that I was there for the root canal. And when is your patient is allergic to epinephrine, right? Those patients who have uh, epinephrine allergy. What, what, what are we using? I use mepivacaine or Sitness. Anybody ever try using Sitness before? This is, I like this. Why do I like this? Because it's a fast onset. Most anesthetics are packaged at a pH of around three and a half. Okay, very acidic. Okay, and it takes them a long time to buffer up to body's pH. Well, in this case, and I, again, I don't like sit nest in the maxilla, but I'll like it in the mandible because in the mandible, it works well and it lasts longer. And you can see that it's packaged at a pH really close to the body's pH, so it works really fast. Okay. And then lastly, an anesthetic. Has anybody seen this? Anybody buffered their anesthetic yet? Buffered it, used the uh, onset? You have to use that cartridge the same day. So I tried using it and I I buffered all my anesthetic in the morning, and the first one worked awesome. The rest of them stunk. And then I did it a couple times, and I said I returned it, and I said this this stuff doesn't work for me. It doesn't work in my hands. And they're like, hold on, hold on, don't return it. Did you watch the video? I said, of course I did not watch the video. I was like, <laughs> my staff watched the video, and they did everything for me. You gotta get on our shift. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And so, so they go, well, you know, don't. You know, this is what they're saying. They say, well, in two minutes, you should be at the same level of numbness as you would with articaine or lidocaine. And that's your big savings in time and money. So I said, okay, well, I said, I don't know if I believe you. They go, well, let, some, let, let a representative from the company call you and they'll guide you through it. So I was near my lunchtime and all of a sudden, my staff like, there's a doctor that wants to talk to you from the company. I'm like, oh, sweet. I want to talk to these people. I want my money back and everything. And the, I get on the phone and the guy's like, are you an idiot? I'm like, Oh, this is the way the company talks around the wow, it's really interesting. Now, this is Stanley Malamed. He goes, I, I think you're doing everything wrong. I was like, wow, Stanley Malamed is calling me to tell me that I'm an idiot. Awesome. I was like, so happy. And so he guided me through what I was doing wrong. You're right. It's like opening a can of Coke. It only, the fizz is only good for that day. You have to buffer it two minutes before you use it. You can't buffer everything in the morning because it doesn't work that way. But if you do buffer it correctly, it's a great way to get your patients numb quickly. And I do like it. So you have to do it correctly. Um, they have that little cartridge, that exchange cartridge that you put the buffer in one side and you put your uh, anesthetic in the other side. And it exchanges uh, a little bit out and buffers your anesthetic. You use it right away. I found patients got numb really quickly. But again, you have, it has, you have to use it on every patient that day. You can't just pick and choose when to use it. I think you get about eight, right? You get about eight carpules out of it. Yeah, I mean, you do get quite a few. Again, you cannot use it as a Hail Mary. So, yeah, they don't, use, they don't have single dose, you know, which would be nice, you know. I agree. So that's kind of where we're at here. It, it's, it's not used for um, uh, only fearful patients or only infected. You got to use it at every patient. Again, um, if you want to use it, I, they don't pay me to say anything. I just think that I give you full knowledge, okay. And lastly, before we take a break, if George Clooney puts a rubber dam on, everybody should put a rubber dam on, okay? <laughs> no rubber dam, no endo, okay? This is the way I look at it, and this is what I'm thinking about as far as rubber dams go. Um, patient protection, okay? There's asepsis, there's lost instruments that we don't want to deal with, okay? Irrigation, guess what? I use full strength sodium hypochlorite. The only way you can get away with that is by using a rubber dam, okay? Self-protection, better vision, but look at this. This is what I do. I put the rubber dam on there, and then if I don't find that I have a hermetic seal all the way around, I'll use this right here, Aura Seal. Anybody ever use this before? It's great. It's by Ultradent. Okay, great product. In combination with a rubber dam, you get a great seal. Okay, so I'm a big fan of that. Okay, it's kind of like a putty. And I use I usually use uh, rubber dam clamps that have wings on them. Okay, and the AAE, and this is what you were asking about. It says only dental dam isolation minimizes the risk of contamination of the root canal system by our own bacteria. So I'm going to stick with that until I see research that proves otherwise. And I know what you're talking about because I think that's a great uh, adjunct to 
to dentistry, but I think we're not there yet when it comes to endo. Okay. If that happens, just go ahead and do that right there. Just contact your malpractice carrier right away. Okay. That's, that's, there's no use for that. It's too scary. Have you tasted sodium hypochlorite? I had my assistants taste it. <laughs> then they know never to get it in the back of a patient's mouth ever. Okay. It's disgusting. It's absolutely disgusting. Okay. But it works. And just like we don't want anything from uh, our mouths coming into the canal, we don't want anything from our canals leaving the environment. Okay. Guess what? I want the cheeks retracted. I want the tongue out of the way. I don't want to fight with that stuff. Okay. I want to create a dry field. And when I create a dry field, that's going to allow for maximum light penetration. And when that happens, you're going to get a much better result. Why don't we use a rubber dam? Why? Because we had to, you know, I don't think there's a lot of patient reluctance. I, I, I'm okay. You know, patients usually are pretty good with that. Okay. And I think a lot of it comes to the experience of the dentist. Uh, in my experience in dental school, it was quadrant isolation. Quadrant isolation is a pain. Okay. But as you said before, as with what we talked about in We Can't Buy Time, that's one thing that a rubber dam does for you. It buys you time. Okay. So again, this is all you need. It's very little cost. Okay. Is that the armamentarium is small, but the amount of time that you have saved gives you more time to what? Look for canals, irrigate, shape, instead of fight the tongue, fight the lip. This is what I use. I use two clamps. I don't, you don't need to get complicated with this. Okay. This is for my maxillary molars and mandibular molars. This is for my maxillary and mandibular premolars and anteriors. That's it, two clamps. I'm trying to simplify things for you. I don't need you to have a big 14 different types of clamps. Okay, will I go the extra mile? Yes, I'll go the extra mile sometimes. Okay, I don't like to do that. I like to see it like this. Okay, I want this rubber dam frame, the rubber dam, one hole. I want the clamp and the forcep handed to me. How long should this take you? It should take you 45 seconds. How do I know that? Because this video is 45 seconds long. Okay? And that's it. All right? And this is for demonstration purposes, and it actually takes me a lot less time. Okay? You take that, you, you flip it over that, and that's how long it should take. I think that 45 seconds is going to save you a lot more time down the line. It's worth its weight in gold. So that's kind of where you're at there. So once you flip that over, and if you feel like you have a good seal, you're ready to go. Otherwise, or a seal, you're done.